If you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. You're welcome to utilize a Bible that's in the pew there as well. Or if you have your phones, please go to Jeremiah 17. I appreciate Mark Larson stepping in last week uh, so that uh, my family and I, we could step away for a little bit and uh, be refreshed. And I'm just grateful for Mark and the nice job that he did. Uh, last week in Mark's message, he talked about how the nation of Judah was caught up in adult, or, uh, adultery, but idolatry. And all of these things, this false sense of spiritual security, and these people were going through the motions. You know, they were kind of checking off their spiritual box, so to speak. And sometimes here in the American church, we just go on Sunday, we check our box, and then we go back to life how we want to live, not necessarily how God would desire us to live. He also mentioned that Jeremiah would have many messages to the nation of Judah that would be from God, and they'd be pretty heavy and necessary. These people needed to change. They were living in rebellion. They were worshiping other things other than God. Jeremiah is God's mouthpiece. And over time, Jeremiah begins to struggle with the task that God is asking him to do. Imagine these messages over and over to these people. Please repent. Turn of your wicked ways. Destruction is coming. And these people, they're not doing it. He's seeing no fruit. People aren't changing. How discouraging would that be? I mean, imagine this, farmers. If every spring you went out and you just planted seeds every spring, but nothing grew up. Wouldn't that be a little discouraging after a while? I mean, this is Jeremiah's life. This is his ministry. He's being obedient to God, but there's not any fruit that he can see. People aren't changing. He's even being persecuted, even to the point where his own family starts to reject him. And he gets to a point where he's asking God the question, why do wicked people prosper while I'm going through all these difficult things. Jeremiah begins to feel betrayed by God and feeling that God has been unfaithful to him. That's a little refreshing for me to see a huge prophet like Jeremiah going through these moments of questioning God. Isn't that refreshing? I mean, do you ever go through times where you question God? And I think we're, we're hearing from a real person here. Jeremiah is sharing his heart. And often, when we're down in our circumstances, we can have the same feelings that Jeremiah had. Feeling like God has abandoned us. Feeling that, that he is unfaithful. But the wind shifts for Jeremiah here in this chapter 17. And we're going to walk through this. As God speaks through Jeremiah to the nation of Judah, I believe that God's words through Jeremiah also minister to Jeremiah. Now let me ask you this question because I know it's true for me as a pastor. As I prepare a message or a lesson and then I go through that process and then I share it to people, there are things that God is doing in me in the preparation and in the sharing. There's a ministry that God is doing. It's one of the things I love about what I get to do is there's a ministry that's happening to me as I'm preparing. If you've ever taught, if you've ever done Sunday school, if you've ever done anything, you can probably say the same thing. As you're preparing these things, God's doing a ministry to you as you prepare to minister to other people. Same thing here for Jeremiah. He's going to speak on behalf of God to the nation of Judah, but while he's speaking these things, I think Jeremiah gets a word of encouragement, and it shifts his demeanor. I don't know where you're at in your circumstances here today, but my hope is that this message will be an encouragement to you, that this will be a word from the Lord that will shift where you are at. It did for Jeremiah. I believe these words have the power to minister to us. And before we read them, I want to pray and ask for the Lord's blessing upon our time here spent in His Word. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for this time in your word. You speak to us. You speak directly into our heart through the power and the anointing of your word. We ask for your blessing over this time. Please use it, Lord. 
Lord, please use me as I share the things you've pressed upon my heart to share. And Father, we also ask for a blessing upon our children's ministry. I pray for each of the teachers and the staff that is helping right now. Bless them as they serve and love on these kids and share about the love of Jesus. Be with them as well. We thank you now in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're going to start in verse 5 here in chapter 17. So if you'd like to follow along with me, that's where we're going to begin. It says, this is what the Lord says. So Jeremiah is speaking on behalf of the Lord. The Lord gives him this message. He says, cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. So that is where we'll stop for right now. And I want to start walking through this section here. As God speaks through Jeremiah, God is describing two kinds of people in this passage. I don't know if you caught that or not, but there's the one who's cursed, that's trusting in human strength, and there's the one who's blessed because he's trusting in the Lord. And so I want you to look at some of the imagery here on the screen as I reread the one who is cursed. That is the negative consequences that come from trusting in human strength, in human made idols, in human power, in elevation of people and man and all of these things. God says, cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. This is what it looks like for people who do not have a trust in the Lord. Now, I shared with you earlier, Jeremiah struggled with the fact that it seemed that evil people were prospering around him. But the Lord gives them this word. If they're not trusting in the Lord, there's coming a point where they will be in a wasteland. And think about this. Judah is living in this land of milk and honey, and at some point they're going to be taken out of that land. And I bet it'll feel like they're in this dry desert place. And these stunted shrubs, God is addressing Judah, but he's also addressing anyone who puts their trust in something other than God. It will lead you to a barrenness. There won't be life there. You can pursue it, you can chase it all day long, but it won't actually fulfill the longing of your heart. Your heart will be like that desert scene. That's what it looks like when we trust in things other than God. But the flip side, let's let some new imagery here. These trees with roots that grow down into the riverbank. The Bible says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. Blessed meaning these God-designed blessings over your life. If you're trusting the Lord, you're like a tree that's planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep down into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried about long months of drought. And how fitting is that for us to kind of enter into that mentally, the heat that we've experienced, the drought that we've experienced. 
For those who are trusting the Lord, those things will not bother you. And then in a figurative way, if we back up and say, circumstances of life will not get me down. Because I'm trusting in the Lord. And I love the, the roots description here as they go down in and there's a strength that comes from the roots. Not only nourishment, but there's a strength in that. And we even see that when Jesus shares the story of the parable of the four soils or the parable of the sower. And he talks about scattering seed on good soil, on rocky ground, on thorny ground, and then on the path. And that rocky ground, he says, when, when the word comes to somebody who has a rocky soil for a heart, it might take root initially, but it doesn't have the opportunity to grow down deep. And so when the circumstances of life come, the plant withers and dies. We need deep roots. And we get that by trusting in the Lord. Troubles come that's a guarantee. Just because you trust in Christ does not mean you won't have trouble. But as you trust in Christ, He'll get your roots deep down into place so that you can withstand those trials. It's important to know that trusting is a choice. It's not a feeling. Because if I went off my feelings, I'd be in trouble. We have to make a conscious choice I think of the book Sacred Acre and uh, Ed Thomas, that um, coach from Parkersburg who was killed. And one of the things he would tell his athletes when he was coaching was that life is 90% or excuse me, 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. We have a choice when circumstances are dire how are we going to respond to that? Proverbs 3 verse 5 says to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Trusting is something that comes from the heart. And the heart represents a person's inner being. It represents our desires, our feelings, and our thoughts. But there's an issue. Uh-oh. The heart of every problem is the problem in the heart. God tells us in verse 9 that the heart is sick. It's deceitful, meaning it leads down these bad, bad roads that you don't want to be. And it's desperately sick, meaning it's incurable. At the very beginning of this passage, I didn't read this verse, but uh, in Jeremiah 17, verse 1, the Bible talks about Judah as a nation having sin etched into their heart, their stony heart. Can you hear that? I mean, that kind of hurts. The hardness of the human heart. And this this kind of heart is not just stubborn or prideful. This kind of hard heart, it's dead, it's cold, it's unresponsive toward God. And God says it's desperately sick. Something needs to happen. Are we left in this manner? The Bible is very clear we're all born sinners, and guess what that means? That you and I, we all have this heart of stone. And I can go through life, and I can be kind to people the best that I know how. I can open doors for the elderly. I can say please. I can say thank you. I can do my best not to lie or cheat or, or do any of that stuff. I'll go to church. I'll sing the songs. I'll give the money. But guess what? I still have a heart of stone with sin etched onto it. I have a heart problem. And here's what humanity tries to do. I'll just do all of these good things and hopefully the last moment of my life when I 
go to heaven. And I'll stand before God and I'll be like, look, I did a bunch of really good things. Will you please let me in? God's going, no, look at your heart. It's desperately wicked. There's a problem that you did not take care of. And the issue is sin. You never dealt with it. How's the heart cured? Any guesses? With Jesus. Jesus came to solve this problem. The heart is desperately wicked, but with the new covenant that Jesus brings, there's something that can take place. It's a heart transplant. And Ezekiel prophetically speaks about this, and Jeremiah even hints toward it too. In Ezekiel 36, 26, I'm going to read this to you. God says, I'm going to give you a new heart, and I'm going to put a new spirit in you. Not, I'm going to do some reconstruction on this stone. I'm going to give you a new heart, and I'm going to put a new spirit in you. And he says... I'm going to remove from you your heart of stone. And then it says, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Not as hard there, right? There's a, it's pliable. You can shape it. You can work with it. It's responsive, right? It's not cold. It's not dead. It's alive because God did a heart transplant in you. Jeremiah talks about how in the new covenant, this is in chapter 31, he says, I will make a covenant with the people of Israel. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. So here on this heart, I have the Ten Commandments. But God writes these things on our heart. This is the only way I'm able to be obedient to God is because he gave me a heart transplant and he writes his law on my heart. It's a work of God. Jeremiah 32, I'll make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good for them. I will put a desire in their hearts to worship me. You can't do that with the heart of stone. But you can do that with the heart transplant and the new heart that God gives you. I will be their God. They will be my people. Chapter 32 says, and they'll never leave me. So what's also really cool about this, this heart transplant, God gives me a new heart. He puts his law on it, but uh, he also, he lives in this new heart. Galatians 4, verse 6, because you are his sons or daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The Holy Spirit, who back in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says the spirit's hovering over the waters at creation, and that same spirit can live within your heart. It says he spent, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, and the Spirit calls out to God the Father, Abba, Father. Ephesians 3, 16 through 17, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, He may strengthen you with the power through His Spirit that is in your inner being. God resides in us. And it says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Yes, the heart is desperately wicked. It's incurable. But God can change your heart. Because of the new covenant, he gives us a new heart. A new heart that can be responsive to him. A heart of flesh. And I want to read to you just a, a section from a sermon of Charles Spurgeon when he talks about a heart of flesh. I just love his words. He says, what is it meant by a heart of flesh? He says, it means a heart that can feel on account of sin. A heart that can bleed when the arrows of God stick fast in it. It means a heart that can yield when the gospel makes its attack. 
a heart that can be impressed when the seal of God's word comes upon it. It means a heart that is warm, for life is warm. A heart that can think, a heart that can aspire, a heart that can love. Putting all in one, the heart of flesh means that new heart and that right spirit which God giveth to the regenerate, the one who's been reborn. But wherein does this heart of flesh consist? Wherein does its tenderness consist? Well, its tenderness consists in three things. There is a tenderness of conscience. Men who have lost their stony hearts, they're afraid of sin. And even before sin, they are afraid of it. The very shadow of evil across their path frightens them. The temptation is enough for them. They flee from it as from a serpent. They would not dally and toy with it, lest they should be betrayed. Their conscience is alarmed even at the approach of evil. And away they fly. And in sin, even tender hearts, when they do sin, they are uneasy. It says, As well might a man seek to obtain quiet rest on a pillow stuffed with thorns, as the tender conscience gets any peace while a man is sinning. So those who have this heart of flesh, if they're making poor choices, ungodly choices, there's a conviction. That's what Spurgeon's talking about. It says, and then after sin, here comes the pinch. The heart of flesh bleeds as though it were wounded to its very core. It hates and it loathes and it detests itself that it ever should have gone astray. It says, ah, stony heart, you can think of sin with pleasure. You can live in sin and not care about it. And after you sin, you can roll the sweet morsel around your tongue and say, who is my master? I care for none. My conscience does not accuse me, but not so with the tender heart. Not so. Tender heart is broken. Before sin and in sin and after sin, it smarts and cries out to God. So also in duty as well as in sin, the new heart is tender. Hard hearts care nothing for God's commandments. Hearts of flesh wish to be obedient to every statute. Only let me know my master's will and I will do it. The hearts of flesh, when they feel that the commandment has been omitted or that the command has been broken, they mourn and they lament before God. Oh, there are some hearts of flesh that cannot forgive themselves. If they've been lax in prayer, if they've not enjoyed the Sabbath day, if they feel that they have not given their hearts to God's praise as they should, these duties which the heart of stone trifles with and despise, hearts of flesh value and esteem. If the heart of flesh could have its way, it would never sin. It would be as perfect as its Father who is in heaven, and it would keep God's command without flaw of omission or of commission. Have you, dear friends, such a heart of flesh as this? So God gives us a heart transplant, but here's another spiritual truth. So you and I, we can walk around with Christ redeeming our hearts and lives, but you and I, we still have a sin nature. Oh. <laughs> we still have the capacity to sin, don't we? And we live in this world that's cursed by sin. There's a redeemed nature that the Lord gives us, and there's still our sin nature nature and we will battle with this I was listening to a message this past week from David Jeremiah and he talks about how two natures beat within my breast one is foul and one is blessed the one I love and the one I hate and then catch these words the one I feed will dominate so as we walk this life with heart transplants from God himself, we will still battle with the issues of sin, the issues of life, 
and our sin nature will get the best of us. You don't have to go many hours even after a Sunday service. And we're going, oh, where did that thought come from? This sin nature is in our DNA even though we have this heart transplant. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Last week, Mark gave us a very strong warning, and I appreciated this. There's this advice in the world, and it creeps into the church. When somebody's expressing the things that might be going on in their life, I got a decision I got to make, and then the poorest counsel I think that could ever be given is just follow your heart. Don't do that. I know my sin nature. My feelings are going to get in the way, and I'm going to make a poor choice. But a heart that's in tune with the Holy Spirit, you can follow that, but it's important to say I need to listen to the Spirit then, not necessarily my heart. About a week and a half ago, my family uh, had the opportunity to see the Sight and Sound theater and, and production out in Pennsylvania, and they're doing David right now, and I just want to do a quick plug on that. They're going to show that live over Labor Day weekend. Do whatever you can to see it. And if at all possible, if you can get to Pennsylvania, go see it. It is the best thing I've ever seen in my entire life, and Brady will say the same thing. Unbelievable. But there's a moment in this production where David's mom is teaching him how to shepherd and how to care for the flock. This is important. David's just a little boy in this scene, and she gives him these words. She says, trust in your shepherd. Listen for his word. And then this last one, follow his voice. Follow his voice. Don't follow your heart. Follow his voice. How do you hear his voice? You got to listen for his word. When we trust in our shepherd along the way, he will guide us, he will lead us. We follow his leading. Trusting the Lord is not something we do once, it's a consistent thing. So for me to have a heart of stone that's transplanted into this heart of flesh that Ezekiel speaks about and Jeremiah speaks about is we trust the Lord for our salvation. There's a certain point where you go, I believe this, that I have a heart of stone and that God needs to absolutely give me a new heart. So I need to come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness of my sin and say, God, give me a new heart and come and live in me. That's salvation. We trust the Lord for our salvation. But the day you get saved, do you just stop trusting the Lord after that? Like, yep, I got my salvation, we're good to go, I'll go back and do whatever I want now. We have to trust the Lord in our day-to-day -day life. Even when the circumstances get tough. And we're running up against things like Jeremiah was, when we're questioning God and we're wondering, is he even care is even with me that's when the rubber hits the road and we got to put our trust that the Lord is faithful and he will do what he says he's going to do and we also trust the Lord with our future and that's huge because this is a breakthrough for Jeremiah you'll see this in a moment but we have to trust that there's a day coming that God will right all the wrongs and even though it might seem like the wicked are prospering, guess what? God's going to take care of that someday. And I can trust as I continue to just press into the Lord, I continue to serve Him each and every day, I believe that He'll make it right in the end. But we have to trust that. Do we trust the Lord with our future? There are several illustrations that we can use for trusting the Lord, I'll walk you back to my youth ministry days. It was like one of the first years of being here at the church. And, and you know, you think, well, what could we do to demonstrate what it means to trust in the Lord? Oh, trust falls. You know, where you get the pastor behind you and you fall over and I'm supposed to catch you. And so we tried that one time and um, 
Tim Butcher decides he's going to participate. But he gave me no warning. And I dropped him. <laughs> and now I'm like, well, now the lesson is completely shot. I, you can't trust me, but you can trust the Lord. I think that's my point. But one you've probably heard of before is that in 1859, one of the greatest tightrope walkers in history was Charles Blondin. And he became the first man in history to walk across the Niagara Falls. And there was approximately 25,000 people that were watching him walk this 1,000-foot line that was suspended across the raging falls with no safety nets. And when he safely reached the Canadian side, the crowd cheered this thunderous applause. And on another occasion, he attempted to cross the falls again. This time, however, he was walking with a wheelbarrow. And the crowd gasped as he carefully loaded the front wheel of the barrel onto this tightrope. And then he turns to the crowd and asks if they believed he could do this using the wheelbarrow. And everyone cheered in approval. And they believed that he could do it. And he turned to a reporter who was covering the event. And he looked straight at him and asked the question, Do you believe that I can tightrope across the Niagara Falls? And without blinking, the reporter says, Yes, I do. I know you can do it. I believe. And Blondin paused and he stared into the reporter and he said, If you believe, get into the wheelbarrow. <laughs> but that's what trust in God is like. I mean, you can stand from afar and just applaud the Lord and what he's doing in other people's lives and say, that's, oh, look what he's doing. Isn't that amazing? And then when it comes to you, you're like, oh, can I actually trust the Lord? We get into the wheelbarrow with God. We trust him for our salvation. We trust him with our day today, and we trust him with our future. Now, here's where Jeremiah, he had that uplifting moment. Okay, God speaks through him, and I think as God spoke through him in this verse right here, I think Jeremiah's going, I'm going to keep going. Verse 10, it says, but I, the Lord, search all hearts, and I examine secret motives. I give all people, all people, their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. God's saying, whatever you think this life is, fair, unfair, your circumstances are up, down, whatever, People look like they're prospering, but they're not following me. Guess what? I am going to make everything right. There's a day coming where I'm going to do that. And for those who are believers in Jesus Christ, there's something called the judgment seat of Christ where we'll stand before the Lord and we'll be rewarded for the good things we've done in this body that's been given to us. God will right all the wrongs. And as that word comes, there's a conclusion that Jeremiah has. And I'm going to paraphrase these, but this is verses 11 through 18. His conclusion is, even if people are succeeding by unjust means, they're going to eventually come to ruin. I mean, if they're going to have to stand before the Lord and be called onto account for their actions and how they've been unjustly treating people, God will reconcile the wrong. And so Jeremiah's like, I'm just going to focus on God's throne. Because there, there's a day where I'm going to stand before my maker. And he's going to call me to account for my actions. Remember, 90% how you respond to the 10% of what happens to you. You're accountable for your reactions, or your uh, reaction or actions. And Jeremiah then has a renewal. And he says, God, heal me. God, save me. And he focuses back in on his duties. And so here's my last thing to say to us today. Jeremiah, this amazing prophet, he struggled with circumstances and even feeling like God had abandoned him and that maybe God was unfaithful. But then God's word came to him and it gave him encouragement. And when we keep things in focus that need to be in focus, we get so caught up on the things of this world, will you just put that image right there in your mind 
that whatever you do this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, there's going to be a day where you'll stand before the throne of God, and that's all that will matter. What did you do with August 14th, 2022? What did you do with August 15th, 2022? We keep that in focus, and we get back to serving the Lord. He is faithful. You can trust him. And those who trust in the Lord, they're going to be blessed, and your confidence can be in him. You can take him to the bank. He is faithful. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, I am so thankful that you are a God who gives us a new heart, gives us a new life, guides us in this life, gives us a hope and a future. And Lord, as we're listening to these words here today, it's possible there's someone right now that when you reflect in your own life, you said, have I had a heart transplant? Is that stony heart of sin, has that been removed and God's replaced it? with this heart that only he can give. If you'd like that heart change today and you'd want to make the Lord your Savior today, I invite you to pray with me in your heart and say, Jesus, change my heart. Please forgive me of my sin. Help me. And as you've written your laws on this new heart that I desire to have. I pray that you'd help me to walk in obedience and to trust in you wholeheartedly with my life. Lord, I thank you for this gift of salvation that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for forgiving me. Now help me to walk in this new life and this relationship with you. And Father, for all of us as we respond to today's message, help us to remember, Lord, that you are faithful and we can trust in you. We can trust you with everything, with our salvation, with our day-to-day -day life, and with our future. Help us, Lord. Help us to recognize the weaknesses we still have and the sin nature that still, still tries to, to reign in our life. And I pray, Lord, that we would, we would feed the spirit that's inside of us, that we can be led by your spirit and not led by our sin nature. Father, thank you for this time in your word. In Christ's name. Amen.